Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. This episode continues our fascinating conversation with Daniel Sanchez, an engineering director and Bitcoin enthusiast. As you learned in our previous episode, Bitcoin is a store of value, a digital gold, if you will, where you can store your money in as you perhaps lose trust in the fiat currencies such as dollars and euros or the institutions that run it. And it is that, but the utility of Bitcoin in corporate treasury also exists in other forms. Expect to learn today how Bitcoin can be used in corporate treasury to hedge against financial institutions, how it can be used in short-term funding by potentially offering it as collateral to get your loans, or even using the utility of the blockchain technology itself to do your corporate cash pooling, for example. Guillaume and I really enjoy this episode. It's all nice to talk about the overview of topics and explain how they work, but when you get to talk about how they actually get practically used in the real world, or could be in the future, it just lights us up. Daniel does just that, excellently in this episode as always please rate us on your podcast app and go follow us on instagram at corporate treasury 101 where we'd love to get a dm from you if you have any suggestions about the show and with that on with the episode so dan you give a very good introduction on how bitcoin is a store of value Mm-hmm. Right. And why it's been compared to gold in, in a lot of instances. And it's all about um, as a new asset class, which I really like the way you said that a new asset class, mm-hmm. which is starting from layer one again in this layers of money that you described to us earlier. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're closer to the original asset class, um, just like holding gold and exchanging gold uh, instead of using notes. And we also discussed how the problem with using notes is that as you move away from uh, gold backed notes, um, which is moving away from the gold standard, as, as commonly referred to, that um, what that means is the government or any more party that controls those notes can influence the supply of those notes mm-hmm. in the economy as and when they want, not linked to any specific layer one. Um, so now fiat currency is just this layer without a bottom, almost, right? Uh, which can be completely manipulated however it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so having another asset class which is linked to a layer one again has its own value. To me, that smells a lot like hedging or the mm-hmm. value of that smells a lot like you can use this asset class to hedge against these other asset classes which aren't as stable or aren't as rooted in something layer one. So how does that work? Where is that used today in the world and, and where do you see the value in that for Bitcoin? So you used today in the world, I'm not able to say, right? Because there, there's a lot of companies out there who buy Bitcoin because of the belief that their value in fiat currency will go up. Also because they have very smart ways in how they issue Bitcoin backed bonds, micro strategy. And then other companies like uh, Block and Tesla who, who have done it maybe to kind of follow the road, but yeah. that's a different matter, right? But where does Bitcoin come in terms of hedging, right? You guys did a series of episodes where you talked about foreign exchange hedging, interest rate hedging. But what nobody talks about, and this might seem like a bit, uh, how should I call it? I'm not looking for a doomsday reaction, right? But nobody (laughs) talks about the financial system hedging, right? Uh, A strong reserve currency devaluation hedging, right? So Bitcoin could eventually be the source of that, right? as adoption grows, the value in fiat currency of, of a Bitcoin of a Satoshi will have the tendency to increase. Yeah. So even the slightest percentage of a corporate treasury or a corporate reserve mm-hmm. being stashed away in Bitcoin could actually be a way to hedge against the devaluation of a reserve currency, whether it's the dollar, whether in Europe it's the euro, whether it's something else, right? Because as that val- as that currency debases, mm-hmm. it would allow to absorb some of not all of those shocks, but some of those shocks, right? Now the beauty of it as well from a hedging point of view is that you don't need to go to a financial institution to do that hedging. Mm-hmm. You can do it by yourself, right? You get the Coinbase institution account, uh, you buy your Bitcoin, you set up your cold storage. There are a lot of services to do that out there, but nothing in principle should stop the company from doing it by themselves, mm-hmm. right? And you start and you do not need to think about it. You don't pay monthly fees. You don't pay uh, rates. You don't pay anything on it. And it's a simple hedge, right? Mm-hmm. So I see it really as a financial stability hedge versus uh, a store of value from a company point of view in that mm. part. 
It's interesting because indeed, every time we've talked about most of our topics in this podcast, whether it be hedging, whether it be um, investments, there's always this middle party, right? There's always mm-hmm. the bank, there's always the financial institution in the middle. Uh, we've always sort of joked about fees linked to that and everything like that in the past. Um, but we never really talked about the risk of those financial institutions. We always say, uh, but then you have a financial institution who guarantees the transaction. Mm-hmm. We talked about trade finance, for example. Uh, you can go to a financial institution when you're looking at the bonds market, the secondary markets, for example, right? Um, but we never, and we say, oh, then that's much safer and this and that. But I think it's also, you know, from a privileged position living in Europe, think, thinking about European uh, economics, thinking about American economics, we, we are used to stability. Mm-hmm. So we're used to these financial institutions being very safe. Mm. Um, whereas maybe you come from part of the world where that isn't the case, uh, where you can't have as much trust in the financial institutions like we so candidly take advantage of uh, and think it's just, yeah, banks safe. Mm-hmm. Um, this could be a really good way to hedge against those intermediaries in the first place, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. I mean, there are examples of that. I mean, uh, Venezuela has been one of the key adopters of Bitcoin, Argentina, the same thing. And what are the, what's the characteristic of those companies? Their underlying fiat currency is not stable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what allows fortunate or sometimes even less fortunate people to be able to maintain yeah. their base value. Because usually they would do that with dollars, Right, which is the global mm-hmm. reserve currency, mm-hmm. right? Um, but actually, as nowadays, there's a lot of really interesting stuff on that about how, for example, inflation on the dollar doesn't hit the U.S. It hits all the other countries who who have dollar-based debt. Dollar-based yeah. debt, indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, so the U.S. almost exports their inflation. So you also hedge against that. So because oh, someone say, why would I buy Bitcoin if I'm Venezuela? Why would I not buy dollars? Yeah. But the dollars is still dependent on the U.S. government. Um, being able to manipulate its supply of dollars in the world, right? And then you're still, uh, let's say, exposed to that risk. You're still exposed to that risk. And there's a, there's another thing, right? Is where are you going to get dollars from an ATM machine in Argentina? Yeah, that's, that's right. True. So the, the limited amount of physical dollars is, is really, really limited. Number two, if you want to leave the country with ten thousand dollars, somebody's going to see that envelope with that stack of notes in your in in your backpack, right? If you want to leave the country with Bitcoin, or if you even just want to send it, there are tons of ways in which you can do it incognito, really, without the supervision of anyone. But going back to a corporate, if you're a corporation sitting in those countries with a very volatile uh, fiat currency, you could hedge using dollars Mm -hmm. or if you also think hey look i sit in venezuela the value of my dollar is gonna um, versus my base currency Mm -hmm. is going to change so much i can also hedge using bitcoin bitcoin indeed indeed Indeed. very interesting so so you hedge against the financial system or the counterparties of the financial system with bitcoin Mm -hmm. now what are the other uses that we could have in corporate treasury of bitcoin there, there are two things. One of them is really financing, right? Yeah. So a lot of what you hear nowadays is about DeFi, decentralized finance, right? Yes. But even in cases of centralized finance, a lot of these new institutions coming in, nowadays they're actually taking in Bitcoin as collateral for lending. Okay. Right? Uh, the way a lot of these systems work, not all of them, but the way a lot of these systems work is that depending on the amount that you want to borrow, mm-hmm. right, and depending on the interest rate that you want to pay, you will have to provide more or less Bitcoin as collateral. Okay. So what does this actually allow you to do is if a corporation has one Bitcoin yes. in their corporate treasury, and they need a short-term liquidity injection to, to do a promotion, to do a project, whatever it is, right? Is nothing stops them from giving that Bitcoin as collateral, Okay. right? So, which that institution still acknowledges that that Bitcoin is yours, but they're holding, they're taking custody of it, mm-hmm. and they provide the liquidity to you, right? Okay. Typically, the liquidity is provided in what is called stable coins, but it's US dollar equivalents. Nothing stops you from changing it to US dollars or into euros, right? Mm-hmm. But that gives you the liquidity you need in fiat currency to invest in right now. Now, okay. obviously, you would not use it as collateral just to spend the money because then you'll never see your Bitcoin back, right? But if a company has the intention to invest it in a project that will provide the adequate returns, mm-hmm. it then does give it the adequate cash flows to one, 
pay back the fiat value that okay. it took as a loan yeah. and within the due time take back that bitcoin okay. or more with whatever the fiat value of that bitcoin will be at that point in time and so exactly that's the point bitcoin is qu the value of bitcoin in fiat currency is quite volatile mm -hmm. so how do you use that as a collateral because at some point in time maybe right now i'm giving a bitcoin i mean i'm having a bitcoin as a collateral to my debts Mm -hmm. But maybe in two months, the value of the Bitcoin has totally changed one way or the other. And the bank will say, look, now we need, uh, we, need, we will need you to have two Bitcoins in order to guarantee this loan that we made two months ago. It, it, can, it can happen. Okay. It can happen, right? But when you look at, and, and that's why not all the platforms are the same, right? And that's mm -hmm. why you need to be aware in terms of the amount of collateral or, or, or counterparty risk that you represent to the exactly. other individual, right? So. Yeah. Uh, most, at least what I've seen in practice, and I'm talking from a personal level, right? What I've seen in practice is you get lent a fraction of what you provide as collateral, okay. which provides you the adequate buffer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a good theoretical exercise, yeah. right? For a corporate treasury. Now, obviously one Bitcoin today is worth whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That probably doesn't allow a big company to do a lot of business, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're a startup and you have one Bitcoin, it can maybe give you the $2,000 or $3,000 that you need to inject to make sure that you keep on getting the right levels of cash flow. So mm -hmm. typically what you get lent out is significantly, significant. it's a fraction of the collateral that you provide. Okay. okay. And if you look in terms of giving collateral, there's one. If you, if you have that Bitcoin stored, mm -hmm. if that Bitcoin has been yours, in the end, you're not impacting overall, you're not impacting your cash flows. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? Yeah. Uh, you're not providing as collateral a cash flow producing asset. So if you're a big company, you're not giving a factory or a machine yes. or your house where you have to live in, mm -hmm. right? Or your offices, right? But you're providing a store value or a pure form of value mm -hmm. that is not affecting your cash flows overall yeah. and is ideally giving you an instrument that can produce cash flows. How so? How would it produce cash? I don't know. So the, 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 the fiat get. value that you get or the fiat uh, okay. money that you get this morning is mm. what ideally you should then have or invest into uh, okay. to create the cash flows, which will then allow you to pay back. Okay. Yeah. So that's for financing. To, to financing. The, 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 the last one really would, uh, is, is payments, right? Okay. Uh, Lightning. So Bitcoin network is known to be slow. Right, and it's it's expensive from a transaction point of view, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a secure second layer called the Lightning Network, which has a significant amount of adoption. Big companies already use it today okay. uh, for certain payments. You find Amazon, uh, really? you find some movie. Yes, you find a you find a lot of e-commerce which today actually use or accept Lightning Network for payment. So, what's what's Lightning Network? Lightning Network is essentially it's it's a network of of nodes that are coded yeah. to run uh, a specific protocol or the so-called smart contracts, which what they can do is they allow a node or a, so a part of this network mm -hmm. to actually hold third party money or third party Bitcoin in this case okay. until a certain amount of conditions are affected. So what, what happens is you as a company, you can build a Lightning Network node where you put in one Bitcoin. Yeah. You can connect that node then to as many other nodes as you want to in the Lightning Network, mm -hmm. where you provide liquidity into those connections. Okay, so out of that one Bitcoin, imagine you say you, you establish 10 connections, you put 0 0.1 Bitcoin okay. into each one of those connections. And basically, once that Bitcoin is put in there, it allows for you to transact with those nodes, mm -hmm. right? That 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Okay. Okay. So effectively what you're creating is you're creating a network of payments, okay? Mm -hmm. These payments can be routed at the 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 Satoshis per okay. transaction. So if you take that out of 10 million, that's well below the 0.5% that Visa or MasterCard will make you pay, mm -hmm. okay? So this is how the, how, the, how the network, how the Lightning Network is built, okay? okay? So how could a company use this? eventually from a treasury point of view. Mm -hmm. So you guys have talked a lot about Hussam's cafe, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it if, did. If, if Hussam ends up having 
10 cafes yeah. across the whole world. Right? When? When? When, <laughs> when Hussam has the 10 cafes across the whole world mm -hmm. and he has one central headquarters, yeah. right? He can actually set up lightning nodes in all of those elements, right? Okay. You can actually put Bitcoin reserves into those specific channels. Mm -hmm. You can actually use those nodes to do your cash pooling. Why do okay. you need to do it through a financial institution? Why do you need to do that through a financial institution? Right? Yeah. You can do that through the Lightning Network for a fraction of the costs. Okay. And you can use that, you can do that with a click of a button. You can actually even automate it if you want to. Okay. The second part is once you have that set up in all your different cafes, Usam, is as people gradually get their lightning wallets into their mobile phones, they mm -hmm. actually can start paying you in their Satoshis. Mm -hmm. okay. So that creates not only uh, the fact that you can also receive and get paid into Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which on a longer term could allow for value increase, right? But it, it really allows you to fully interconnect legal entities or different points of sale, whatever it is, mm -hmm. completely separate from what Visa, MasterCard or whatever other system is that you have today, where you pay 0.5, 1% fees. Okay. So there is potential behind it, but point is two critical things. On all the three points that we mentioned, which is legislation, mm -hmm. number one, which is not always easy to come by, uh, and adoption. So legislation, because you need the government to allow you to trade in uh, Satoshis or Satoshis, Satoshis. You need to understand how to treat those from a financial and a tax point of view. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Especially when it comes to uh, capital gains. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially yeah. you can use this capital gains or capital losses. Right. But how that framework today fits is for me as, mm -hmm. a, as, a, as a humble individual is not clear. Okay. Right. But even everything that you hear from uh, from uh, across the board is it's it's still in limbo. Okay. Right. So the value of that, for example, doing a cash pooling like this is twofold. One is the um, the cheaper cost that you mentioned, mm -hmm. right? And some of these, uh, like the night network, maybe not the standard Bitcoin, but some other forms of Bitcoin, um, is cheaper and just as fast, if not faster. But Time isn't typically one of the constraints nowadays from the traditional system. But it's also, like you said, versus the traditional system of Visa, MasterCard, etc., where tomorrow those systems go bust mm -hmm. because they are companies at the end of the day and companies fail all the time. Yep. Um, you're not reliant on that and your payment system doesn't get wiped overnight by yes. Visa going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. No, the, the other thing is, if you think about what we were talking in the beginning, counterparty risk, right? Is if you have a cafe in China and you have a cafe in Canada and another one in Saudi Arabia, no. the Lightning Network allows you to do that without having to go through probably a multiple of no. financial entities. Because, I mean, when we did the cash pooling episode, Jim, we also talked about how usually you want to set that up in within one bank. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So if you do have one in China, one in Canada, and one, you'd have to go to a really big bank, and maybe you're a small-time player for a bank of that size, mm -hmm. and they're not going to give you great favorable terms. Um, but doing it like this would help yeah. you do your cash pooling in a much more effective way. And in one currency, I mean, one. How to say this? Actually, it's not a currency. You can say one it's single, one form of value. One yes, form of value. One form of value. And so, just to come back on this uh, payment you will need any counterparty you are dealing with to be connected to one of those nodes. You cannot just have somebody come in and pay in Satoshi's. You need him or her to have a node. If, exactly. And that's why I said, I mean, uh, you don't need to, to have a node, right? They just need to have a simple Lightning wallet on their phone. Okay. And that wallet can be connected to any node whatsoever. Okay. Right? So uh, having the node, what it allows you to do is you open up your own channels of payment. You mm -hmm. can choose who you connect to. You can choose the fees of transaction okay. across those those nodes, right? Uh, but you, as an individual, Guillaume or you, you can have your own Lightning wallet where yeah. you keep your satoshis, and you can do the payments without having to run an node yourself. Okay, that's super In clear. Business context, I imagine that could be interesting. You could set up if you wanted to do this. Uh, if I'm a cafe, I could set up my own, let's say, payment system, right? I have an app for my cafe. Mm -hmm. Think Starbucks. So Starbucks today, they have a Starbucks app. Yep. You actually, what you do is you deposit cash into the Starbucks app, and then you continuously pay with the app instead of paying with cash. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be set up on a crypto network, right? Or a Bitcoin, yeah, Lightning your, network. your Lightning network node automatically does that. If you yeah. want, you can issue a receipt, 
yeah. which comes with a QR code, uh, which it says the value and it says the node that this needs to be paid into. The individual who's coming in just scans <coughs> it into their wallet and you get paid. Mm. So what if the network goes down? Because we are saying, okay, we want to eliminate that risk of a counterparty within that chain of taking too much money or mm -hmm. doing whatever with our money or going bankrupt so the bank cannot give you your deposits back. What if the Lightning or the Bitcoin network goes down? Can it happen, first of all? And then how do you do? Every, anything can happen. Obviously, right? yeah. But to be able to bring down 50,000 nodes that are currently running the network plus mm -hmm. the mining networks globally it's a virtually impossible task. Okay. Right? It's a virtually... No, I'm not a computer science major, I'm, but mm -hmm. thinking about it from a logical point of view, yeah. you need 50,000 points of attack plus all the miners, right? So mm -hmm. you really need something to really break down. Now, okay. Power can go out, right? But if power can go out, how are people going to pay you if they don't have cash? Anyways, indeed. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So it's really like it diversifies the counterparty risks to instead of one company, mm. fifty thousand nodes. Exactly. Exactly. And the way, and the way, I mean, a lot of what you hear is it's an alternative. It's um, it's going to replace, and that's why I say I don't think it is going to replace. But it's a it's a very nice complement mm -hmm. if it's set up well and if the legislation allows for it. Okay. Once again, everything in this episode is purely my opinion. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm, not <financial> <laughs> I'm not financial advice. I'm not financial advice. No, but that's super interesting to get how that could affect okay. the corporate treasury uh, landscape. Mm. And yeah, Anything else, Daniel? Uh, let's be concrete. No, green. guys, you, you, you've exhausted me. Yeah? <laughs> Usually, that's you've exhausted good. me. We this has been great. Yeah. Yeah. We need to rethink how we interview our guests. That's the they always say, it. No, I'm exhausted. <laughs> This has been great. This has been great, yeah? Thank also, you so much, really, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Hello again. Really hope you enjoyed that episode as much as we enjoyed recording it. Just a reminder, please do rate us on your podcast app. That's how podcasts get found. And follow us on Instagram. Have a lovely day.